Moving on, uh, our next uh, talk is uh, uh, by Dr. Sachiwani, again our guest speaker, really a, an authority on Barrett's esophagus um, and uh, chair of the Standard Practice Committee of the ASGE who came up last year and will be coming up with another set of guidelines for Barrett's and he's going to basically update us on Barrett's in 2019 and uh, really bring us up to speed. So Sachin, please. Thanks so much, Late, um, for that uh, introduction. So I'm just going to start off with a few basics. Um, Barrett's esophagus, as we all know, is a condition characterized by the replacement of the normal stratified squamous epithelium with columnar-lined esophagus. And you really need to show the presence of intestinal metaplasia and histology to make a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. The reason why we care about Barrett's esophagus is that it's the only identifiable pre-malignant condition for esophageal adenocarcinoma, a cancer that has continued to increase in incidence in the Western population almost by about 500 to 600%. So clearly efforts need to be made if we are to reduce the incidence, morbidity, and mortality associated with this lethal cancer. These are data from the most uh, recent analysis using the SEER uh, database that really drive home this important point. Despite all the advances that we've made in the field of screening and surveillance for Barrett's esophagus, unfortunately, the vast majority of patients still get diagnosed with regional or distant disease. If you look at this graph, we've really not brought about any significant change in the proportion of patients that get diagnosed with regional or distant disease. But fortunately, it's not just all doom and gloom. If you look at the overall survival rate in patients with esophageal cancer, not that great. It's still a dismal 18% when you look at the five-year survival rates, but we are seeing some marginal improvement in the overall five-year survival rate, primarily driven by improved survival in patients with early esophageal cancer that can be managed with endoscopy endoscopic eradication therapy or minimally invasive surgical techniques. So with this background, I hope to cover the following important topics in Barrett's esophagus. First, try and answer this basic question, is screening for Barrett's esophagus effective? And how will recent advances actually impact the way we screen for this disease? I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the issues related to surveillance for patients with Barrett's esophagus and hopefully highlight some of the best practices that you can use on your uh, patients with Barrett's and how you can incorporate this in your endoscopy lab. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the appropriate candidates for endoscopic eradication therapy and provide a pragmatic approach to patients with Barrett's related neoplasia. I'm going to tie all of this into the recently established quality indicators for management of patients with Barrett's esophagus and patients undergoing endoscopic eradication therapy. And then, of course, I'm going to try and highlight some of the recent guidelines published by the ASGE, and I'll show you some of the recent data that were presented by our group at DDW this year. So let's start with uh, the epidemiology of this cancer and the risk factors. Who are the individuals who are at risk for Barrett's esophagus and esophageal adenocarcinoma? These conditions are primarily seen in Caucasian males with advancing age. There's some data suggesting that a family history of Barrett's and esophageal cancer is an important risk factor, but by far the commonest risk factor for Barrett's and esophageal cancer is the presence of chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease, an extremely common condition seen at least in the population in the United States. There's also epidemiologic data suggesting that obesity, tobacco use are also important risk factors, and H. pylori infection may be protective against Barrett's and esophageal cancer. Epidemiologic data also suggest that the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and statins may actually prevent the progression of Barrett's esophagus to esophageal adenocarcinoma.
An important question to answer is, is there enough justification for screening and surveillance of patients with Barrett's esophagus? I will submit to you, I'm extremely biased, so I will tell you that there is good reasoning for us to perform screening and surveillance for Barrett's esophagus. I just told you that esophageal cancer is an important health problem. Screening for Barrett's esophagus, either with endoscopy or some of these novel technologies that I'm going to talk to you about, followed by surveillance once you do make a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, will potentially allow for detection of cancer at an early stage. We have minimally treatment, uh, invasive treatment options for early stage disease. And finally, our ultimate goal is that early detection of Barrett's related neoplasia and cancer will lead to favorable patient outcomes. That's the holy grail for all the investigations that are currently being done in the field of Barrett's and esophageal cancer. Our ultimate goal is to reduce the incidence of esophageal cancer and to improve survival in patients who do get diagnosed with esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now with this, with this background, let's talk a little bit about screening for Barrett's and for esophageal cancer. What do our guidelines state? When should you consider screening for Barrett's esophagus? If you look at the most recent recommendations from the American College of Gastroenterology, it states that you should consider screening in men with chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease with the presence of at least two risk factors. These include age greater than 50, Caucasian race, abdominal adiposity, smoking, and a family history of Barrett's or esophageal cancer. The most recent guidelines that will be published by the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, a document that both Leith and I were a part of, again state that you should consider screening in individuals at risk for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. Who are the individuals who are at the highest risk for Barrett's? Those individuals with the family history of Barrett's and esophageal cancer. Moderate risk individuals are those with a history of chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease, age greater than 50, abdominal adiposity, and a history of smoking. Now, I will tell you that screening for Barrett's is not easy. There are some obvious limitations for this entire approach to screening for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. We know that reflux is extremely common in the U.S. population. Nearly 20% of adult Americans actually suffer from reflux on a weekly basis. I experienced that last night after hanging out with my friends. Barrett's esophagus is extremely common even in asymptomatic individuals. Nearly 25% of patients can have Barrett's esophagus in the absence of chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease. 20 to 50% of patients with cancer have no prior symptoms, and the statistic that disturbs me the most is the fact that less than 10% of patients with cancer have a prior diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, clearly suggesting that our current clinical referral practices really fail to identify the vast majority of patients at risk for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. So what are some of the strategies that you can use in your practice to potentially enhance screening for Barrett's esophagus? We know that screening every individual at risk with endoscopy is just not tenable. Cytosponge is one such approach, which is a minimally invasive cell collection device. This really involves our subjects or individuals potentially at risk for Barrett's esophagus swallowing this capsule that's attached to a string. It's sits in the stomach for about seven to 10 minutes, gets dissolved to the spherical abrasive sponge, and you basically pull that string out, passing the spherical capsule through the distal esophagus, through the entire esophagus, and out of the mouth. That sample is then sent to a lab, and you check for the presence of trefoil factor three, which is a biomarker for Barrett's esophagus. You also perform HNE staining on the samples that you collect. The best part about this technique is that you can actually do this in your office or in the office of your primary care physician. How well does this test actually perform in, with regards to screening for Barrett's esophagus? These are the two 
best studies available. The study title is also best. And it really shows us that the overall sensitivity for detection of Barrett's esophagus is about 70 to 80%. Now, if you use a stringent definition for Barrett's, which is a length of two centimeters or three centimeters, your sensitivity does go up. It also goes up if you can actually convince your patient to swallow the sponge twice. The specificity is also fairly high. It's about 90 to 95%. How many of you have actually swallowed this capsule or the sponge? Dr. Mutasami, I, I knew that. Anyone else? Okay. So, so we were actually a part of this multi-center study looking at the cider sponge for screening for Barrett's esophagus. I was the first one who got the cider sponge in the state of Colorado, and I can uh, guarantee you that I wasn't smiling like the way I am here after that sponge came out of my mouth. Now, um, how well uh, does the cider sponge actually perform um, in the United States? These are data that we presented that um, uh, was actually led by Nick Shaheen, Raman, and myself. We were uh, the sites that contributed data uh, for looking at cider sponge in the US uh, population. And the bottom line is that data at least from the US population suggests that on a scale of zero to 10, uh, the experience with the cider sponge was comparable to that of endoscopy. The vast majority of individuals were willing to undergo a cider sponge again uh, for screening for Barrett's esophagus. I will tell you that the overall diagnostic performance for the cider sponge, at least in the US population, was maybe not as good as the investigators showed us from the Cambridge um, university, and obviously more work needs to be done. But the overall results suggested, again, just like Rebecca Fitzgerald showed us, that the sensitivity is about 70 to 80 percent, and the specificity was about 78 percent in our uh, population. Again, the numbers do get better when you use a more stringent definition for the length of Barrett's esophagus. A few other strategies that may be helpful in screening include transnasal endoscopy. Obviously, the biopsies that you get with transnasal endoscopy are much smaller than your standard um, endoscope. The overall patient tolerability is comparable to your standard upper endoscopy. So this may be one approach to screen patients. Do this unsedated in your uh, offices or by primary care physicians. Another uh, technique that is being investigated, um, and there are um, studies that are ongoing by the Mayo Clinic uh, group, is really to look for the presence of volatile organic compounds, and this can actually predict the presence of Barrett's. There cannot be a better test than this if all your patient really needs to do is blow some air into a device and that device will tell you if you've got Barrett's or esophageal cancer. Unfortunately, the results are still pending and the overall performance, at least based on pilot testing, looks really favorable. Other devices that are being investigated include tethered capsule endomicroscopy, liquid biopsies, and oral microbiome testing. This is my chance to pontificate again with regards to where we need to go with regards to screening for Barrett's esophagus. I think we really need to understand why we as a community are failing to appropriately screen individuals for Barrett's and for esophageal cancer. Is it related to the fact that our patients really don't follow our recommendations or we don't identify individuals who are at risk for Barrett's and refer them for an upper endoscopy? And I I suspect it's the latter. This really, in my opinion, is a fundamental question that we need to answer if we are to reduce the incidence, morbidity, and mortality associated with esophageal cancer. We can potentially ablate every patient with Barrett's-related dysplasia, but believe me, we're just scratching the surface. Let's talk a little bit about surveillance in patients with Barrett's esophagus. We know that once you do make a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, these individuals are enrolled in surveillance programs. The reason why we enroll them in surveillance endoscopy programs is that we know that Barrett's esophagus can potentially progress from these stages of Barrett's with no dysplasia, or only intestinal metaplasia to low grade, to high grade, and to invasive cancer. This happens in 
a stepwise manner, and it happens in a probabilistic fashion. Now, despite all the advances that we've made in the field of biomarkers to identify that holy grail panel of biomarkers associated with risk of progression, at least in 2019, the degree of dysplasia that you find on your biopsy specimens is the best biomarker available to predict the risk of progression in patients with Barrett's esophagus. An important question to ask is, does surveillance actually impact mortality? And I will submit to you, we have no randomized control trials answering this question of surveillance versus no surveillance in patients with Barrett's esophagus. We have data from a systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at all observational studies, and in this study we showed that patients who actually are enrolled in surveillance programs have a lower all-cause mortality and cancer-related mortality when they do under go surveillance. You tend to find cancers at an earlier stage, and these individuals are more likely to undergo an esophagectomy compared to those individuals who are not enrolled in surveillance programs. What do our guidelines state? When you do make a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, you should be obtaining biopsies using the Seattle protocol. I'm sure you're all aware of this. Just as a refresher, these biopsies should be obtained every one to two centimeters in a four quadrant fashion. If you see anything that looks suspicious, any visible lesion, that must be biopsied separately and submitted in a separate jar. You should also be aware of the natural history of patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. We and several other investigators have shown that the overall risk of patients progressing to esophageal cancer is extremely low. In this study, we showed that the risk of progression to cancer is about 0.27% per year. If you look at all the studies that have really tried to address this natural history question of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, all the older studies reported a much higher rate of progression in patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. But I would like to direct your attention to all the contemporary studies to the right, which have consistently shown us that the overall risk of progression in non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus is extremely low. It's about 0.25% per year, the number that I quote to my patients. Put it differently, one in 400 patients will progress to cancer per year. So the overall risk of progression is extremely low. Just like all the issues that I pointed out to you with regards to screening, there are some obvious issues that we deal with with surveillance for Barrett's esophagus. We know that dysplasia and early cancer is indistinguishable from non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. We know that the distribution of dysplasia is patchy. When we obtain these surveillance biopsies, we're really just biopsying a small fraction of the entire Barrett's. Less than 5% of the entire surface area of Barrett's gets sampled during your surveillance endoscopy. And hence this whole issue of sampling errors. We know this practice is time consuming and expensive. And finally, no matter how many guideline statements get pumped out through the standards of practice committee, we know that endoscopists don't necessarily practice what's been published in these guideline statements. I will also tell you, similar to this whole concept of missing cancer in patients undergoing colonoscopy, a similar concept has been proposed in patients undergoing upper endoscopy for patients with Barrett's esophagus. This elegant systematic review and meta-analysis showed us that the miss rate for esophageal cancer can be as high as 25%. Really sobering results. Again, there are some obvious issues in the way we practice endoscopy for patients with Barrett's esophagus. So to address this whole issue of um, suboptimal endoscopy, uh, there have been quality indicators that have been proposed by the American Gastroenterological Association. The first one states that if you do have a patient diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, undergoing surveillance, you should be obtaining biopsies using the Seattle protocol. And once you do make a diagnosis of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, these patients should not come back for a repeat surveillance endoscopy any sooner than three to five years. 
So we decided to answer how well do endoscopists practice these surveillance endoscopies as it relates to these established quality indicators. How many of you submit your data to the GI Quick benchmarking registry? One, two. Excellent. I, I'm certainly not trying to single you guys out, but I'm just going to show you some really sobering results on what's really happening uh, in a nationwide sample. Again, my, my main purpose was to answer these two basic questions. How well are we obtaining biopsies using the Seattle biopsy protocol? And how often are we inappropriately bringing patients back once you do make a diagnosis of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus? nearly 25% of all endoscopies performed in patients with Barrett's esophagus do not have biopsies obtained using the Seattle biopsy protocol. Nearly 30% of patients, once they get diagnosed with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, are brought back too soon for their surveillance endoscopy. So these are all really sobering results, results that we should pay heed to. So clearly, we need intervention trials to try and improve our practices. These are results that we presented at DDW this year, again, looking at the same database to see since we've published these quality indicators since we published our guidelines. Have we seen an improvement in practice amongst us as endoscopists? The good news is that I think our practice has improved with regards to doing appropriate surveillance endoscopies. On the other hand, unfortunately, despite all these quality indicators, we really still do a lousy job in obtaining biopsies using the Seattle biopsy protocol. We've seen no improvement in this quality indicator. How well do we perform with regards to making a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus? I think we're doing a much better job than what we were way back in 2012 and 2013. But unfortunately, this really has not translated to an improvement in detecting dysplasia. That's what we care about, right? That's why we're doing these surveillance endoscopies. We really saw no improvement in detection of low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, or a composite endpoint of low-grade or high-grade dysplasia. So again, the future lies in uh, designing these intervention trials to improve our rate of detection of dysplasia. Again, my, my chance to pontificate, I think we really need to think of all the factors that really drive this overutilization of endoscopy. The way we can actually shift this pendulum towards the center is by educational programs such as these, um, Im improved implementation of our guidelines, shared decision making, and the need for controlled trials. This was a really important uh, abstract presented at DDW, uh, which tried to answer, and this has been asked by several um, colleagues uh, of mine, when should you stop doing surveillance endoscopies for patients with uh, Barrett's esophagus? And none of our guidelines actually address the document that Leith and I worked on. We again shied away from even addressing uh, that question. With this cost-effectiveness analysis, and again, please don't translate what's on this the slide into practice as yet. This paper still needs to be published. This still needs to be implemented in our guideline statements. But what this cost-effectiveness analysis showed us was that if you have no com comorbidities, you could potentially stop surveillance at age 83. If you have multiple comorbidities, you could stop surveillance endoscopies at age 75. Again, uh, thought-provoking uh, results, but just stay tuned for the final paper and see how it pans out with regards to these uh, results being implemented in guideline statements. So what can you do in your practice? At the bare minimum, you should be using the best available endoscope you have in your endoscopy lab whenever you're evaluating a patient with Barrett's esophagus. And this has to be high-resolution endoscopy. That is the de facto standard of care for managing patients with Barrett's esophagus. You should get familiar with identifying areas 
areas that harbor dysplasia or early cancer within the Barrett segment. I don't have the time to review all the different advanced imaging techniques that have been investigated, but there were a couple of abstracts presented at DDW this year, one from the UCI group and from the Amsterdam group looking at artificial intelligence where the uh, computer actually identifies areas that may harbor dysplasia within the Barrett segment. But what you should get familiar with is the use of electronic chromoendoscopy or narrowband imaging, which uses blue light to highlight the mucosal and vascular pattern within the Barrett segment. The first thing you need to do when you do switch on narrowband imaging is to try and differentiate between these two patterns. You want to put that patient into one of these two brackets. Does the patient have a regular mucosal and a regular vascular pattern? This is what it looks like in patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. Or does it look disrupted as you see in these images? So your histologic diagnosis can be predicted during endoscopy by the use of narrowband imaging. These are the initial data that really support the use of narrowband imaging for patients with Barrett's esophagus. I will tell you the overall performance does improve when you make high confidence predictions. This is just an example of what um, examination of patients with Barrett's esophagus should look like. You should take the time to identify the landmarks within the lower esophagus. The first thing is the diaphragmatic pinch. The next landmark is your gastroesophageal junction, which is the top of the gastric folds. My practice is skewed because I primarily see patients with Barrett's related dysplasia or cancer, so I routinely use a distal attachment cap in evaluating these patients and really spend the time inspecting the Barrett segment. You saw a large visible lesion in the proximal portion of the Barrett's esophagus. I then switched to narrowband imaging and you can really appreciate this visible lesion which you saw using high definition white light endoscopy as well. But the advantage of using NBI is not only can you predict the pre presence of um, early cancer and dysplasia but also help you with your resection. I will tell you that the use of NBI actually allowed me to extend my resection. With high definition white light endoscopy, you would have pro probably marked your markings uh, somewhere here, but because of narrowband imaging, I extended my resection all the way up to the two o'clock position going up to the 11 o'clock position. So it does guide us with endoscopic therapy as well. What are some of the other things that you can do to improve on your ability to detect dysplasia? Wide area transepithelial sampling is another approach that really provides um, cells uh, all the way up to the lamina propria. You use an abrasive brush that goes uh, throughout the extent of the Barrett segment. You take that sample, it gets sent to a central lab, it gets analyzed using neural network analyses, and pathologists really provide the same diagnostic categories that you are used to with your pathologist. These are some of the specimens that were provided using this technology. A single randomized control trial that showed us that when you use this technology along with your Seattle biopsy uh, protocol, you actually increase the number of patients that get diagnosed with dysplasia. The absolute increase in this randomized control trial was about 14%. So what are some of the things that you should be doing in your uh, practice at a physician level? Again, I can't stress enough the importance of you spending enough time inspecting the Barrett segment. Hold off on taking your biopsy forceps and sampling. Take the time to inspect the segment for any visible lesions. Photo document all your landmarks. And again, at the bare minimum, you should be using the Seattle biopsy protocol when you do sample. From a cognitive standpoint, this is something that we tell our trainees all the time. Learn about the criteria that have been established using high definition white light endoscopy and narrowband imaging associated with dysplasia and early cancer. And an, at an institutional level, you must demand that you have the best available endoscopes in your practice, and that has to include high definition white light endoscopy. I'm going to spend the last um, few minutes um, before I talk about endoscopic eradication therapy. I'll just let you know that you should 
ensure that all patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus are prescribed a daily PPI. This is something that is recommended by the American College of Gastroenterology. Routine use of BID dosing is not required, but given the chemopreventive effects of PPI therapy, all, your all of your patients with Barrett's esophagus should at the bare minimum be on a daily PPI therapy. Let's talk a little bit about endoscopic eradication therapy. This really represents a paradigm shift in the way we manage patients with Barrett's-related dysplasia. This uh, guideline that I have on the slide is what we published through the American College, uh, through the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, excuse me, using the GRADE uh, framework. Anyone who is interested in endoscopic therapy, I think, needs to be aware of these updated guidelines. This slide, in my mind, is the most important slide which guides us on who are the appropriate candidates for endoscopic therapy. If you have a lesion that breaches the muscular mucosa and actually extends into the submucosa, these are individuals that you should refer to your surgical colleagues for an esophagectomy given the high risk of lymph node metastases. On the other hand, if you have any lesion that's above the muscularis mucosa, limited to the mucosa, these are appropriate candidates for endoscopic eradication therapy. Recognize that I mentioned this yesterday as well. Unlike the colon, there are lymphatics that get into the mucosa and the esophagus, so there is a small but a finite risk of lymph node metastases in patients with mucosal cancer. That risk is up to 2%. What are the principles of endoscopic eradication therapy? You really want to resect any visible lesion that you see within the Barrett segment. That's the lesion that's going to harbor the highest grade of dysplasia. You then want to eradicate all the remaining Barrett's esophagus to reduce the risk of metachronous neoplasia. That risk is about 30%. This is a patient that was referred to our practice and you can appreciate a large area of nodularity seen extending from the two o'clock to the five o'clock uh, position. It's my practice to mark the lesion before I start start resection, and you again, just like with colon resection, you really want to be systematic in your approach to resection. You, this approach is the multiband mucosectomy technique. You suck the lesion up, and then you use a hexagonal um, snare to actually resect the lesion. It really doesn't matter whether you cut below or above the band. My practice is to cut below the band. And again, you want to remove all visible lesions that you see during um, endoscopy, even if it amounts to us resecting more than half of the circumference of the esophagus. If you're going to do this um, in your practice, you need to be facile in the management of all complications related to resection or radiofrequency ablation. And at least as of now, in 2019, even after you achieve complete eradication, these patients need to be enrolled in surveillance programs so that you can detect early recurrence. What do our guidelines state? Our guidelines strongly recommend against surgery for patients with Barrett's-related high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal cancer. Again, we have no randomized control trial. I don't think any of us in our lifetime will see a randomized control trial comparing endoscopic therapy to esophagectomy. We have good observational data showing that the overall survival in patients undergoing both these procedures is comparable. But one major difference is the fact that endoscopic eradication therapy is associated with a lower rate of adverse events. It's again really important that you resect any visible lesion within the Barrett's segment. Performing an EMR will result in a change in diagnosis. Based on this systematic review, we showed that performing EMR for any visible lesion will result in a change in diagnosis in nearly 40% of all patients. Vast majority actually have their diagnosis upstaged. Our guidelines clearly recommend that if you see a visible lesion, you should perform endoscopic mucosal resection.
Here's another way of performing endoscopic mucosal resection for any visible lesion. This was, again, a patient referred to our practice. You really don't need narrowband imaging to appreciate almost a mass-like lesion extending from the 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock position. I was concerned about the possibility of this lesion harboring submucosal cancer. I don't routinely perform EUS anymore for these lesions. I did for this uh, patient, and I proceeded with endoscopic mucosal resection using the CAP technique. One of the most important, and um, uh, late talked about this during LA Live yesterday, the most important thing is to ensure that you get a good submucosal lift. And then you actually place the snare at the tip of the CAP, suck the lesion up, almost to a point where you get a red out and then proceed with resection. Again, the concept is same. You should resect all visible lesions that you should, uh, see during endoscopy and this should be done in a stepwise uh, fashion. Uh, my earlier practice, I used to actually um, ablate any vessel that I would see using the coag grasper. I don't do that anymore. Only if there's evidence of active bleeding will I proceed with uh, ablation of any uh, visible vessel. Our practice also is to pin our specimens for our uh, pathologists. They believe that that allows them to really orient the specimen and answer this question whether there's deep invasion and of course the lateral edges don't matter when you perform a piecemeal uh, resection. Again, an important point to remember when you have Barrett's related dysplasia, you need to confirm that diagnosis by an expert pathologist given the fact that our pathologists just don't agree with each other when it comes to a diagnosis of dysplasia. Not only that, an expert pathology review will result in a change in diagnosis in nearly 55% of patients. So our guidelines recommend that when you do have a patient with Barrett's related dysplasia, confirm this diagnosis by an expert GI pathologist or a panel of pathologists. Now, who are the individuals that you should refer for endoscopic eradication therapy? Without a doubt, patients with high-grade dysplasia should be referred for endoscopic therapy. Patients with confirmed low-grade dysplasia should also be considered for endoscopic eradication therapy. And we have good evidence, evidence from randomized control trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA showing us that ablation reduces the risk of progression in patients with high-grade dysplasia and patients with confirmed low-grade dysplasia. Beyond all these RCTs, we also have data from effectiveness trials, data from our routine clinical practice, again demonstrating the effectiveness of endoscopic therapy. So what do our guidelines state? Our guidelines, again, strongly recommend endoscopic therapy compared to surveillance in patients with high-grade dysplasia. We recognize the all the controversies related to low-grade dysplasia, so we really provided a pragmatic approach to low-grade dysplasia. While we do recommend endoscopic therapy for these patients with confirmed low-grade dysplasia, for patients who really want to avoid the adverse events related to our endoscopic procedures, surveillance is a perfectly fine option as well. These are all the adverse events that you should be aware of associated with endoscopic therapy. I see all these patients in my clinic before I embark on endoscopic therapy. So these are all estimates that I discuss with my patients in clinic. Recurrence of intestinal metaplasia and dysplasia is real. These are data from our uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that showed us that the incidence of intestinal metaplasia is about 4.2 per 100 patient years. That of early neoplasia, thankfully, is much lower. It's about 1.4 per 100 patient years. So our guidelines do recommend that once you do achieve complete eradication, these patients are still enrolled in surveillance programs. These are just some data that we presented at DDW this year about your surveillance protocol, when you should be looking for recurrence. These are data from our TREAT BE consortium, which really was established to look at clinical outcomes related to endoscopic therapy, and UCLA uh, is a major player in this. Um, we also established quality indicators um, using this consortium. Based on our data, we felt that the recurrence of intestinal metaplasia was about 
15% um, with an incidence of 5.2 per 100 patient years. For dysplasia, it was about 4.5 for an incidence rate of about 1.6 per 100 patient years. Thankfully, the vast majority of recurrences are of the same histologic grade or a lower histologic grade. None of these patients actually progressed to invasive cancer. None of these patients actually required anesophagectomy. We also identified some predictors. I won't go into the details of all the predictors, but if you have high-grade dysplasia or cancer, you're at a higher risk for having a recurrence. If you have a large hiatal hernia, you have a high risk of recurrence. And the number of sessions that you take to achieve complete eradication is an important predictor of recurrence. These are just some suggested surveillance intervals. These have not made it to our guidelines, uh, but something that you should be aware of, how often you should bring these patients back once you do achieve complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. These are some recent data published by others, um, and um, it really tells us how you should be obtaining biopsies when you've achieved complete eradication and these patients are coming for surveillance endoscopies. I think we've moved away from this practice of obtaining biopsies every one centimeter from the original length of the Barrett segment. We really focus obtaining biopsies from the gastric cardium, the gastroesophageal junction, and the distal two centimeters of the esophagus in addition to any visible lesions that you may see in the esophagus. Lastly, if endoscopic eradication therapy is a part of your practice, you need to be aware of these quality indicators that we established endorsed by the ASGE and ACG. I'm going to end by just providing a pragmatic approach to uh, patients with Barrett's-related neoplasia. Consider referral of these patients to high-volume tertiary care centers. You need to confirm the diagnosis of dysplasia by your expert GI pathologist. Repeat the endoscopy using high-definition white light endoscopy, narrowband imaging, and really look carefully for any visible lesions. If you find visible lesions, you should perform endoscopic mucosal resection. What you do next is really dependent on your pathology specimen. If you have submucosal cancer, that patient should be referred to your surgical colleagues for an esophagectomy. If you have high-grade dysplasia or intramucosal cancer, continue with endoscopic therapy with the goal of achieving complete eradication of intestinal metaplasia. If you have low-grade dysplasia, you really manage this on a case-by-case -case basis, and once you do achieve complete eradication, enroll these patients in surveillance programs. A big shout-out to our esophageal and gastric multidisciplinary clinic, which we established in 2013. We've now seen more more than 1,500 patients with Barrett's and esophageal cancer at our center, and then, of course, to my kids. Thank you. Uh, such a nice